Hello and welcome back to Things Made Simple. Over the last several videos, we've been delving into the details of how to create a YM3812 general MIDI synthesizer. In the first couple videos, we figured out the hardware of the module and eventually turned it into a credit card sized circuit board. But most of the videos have really focused on the software side of things. And in this video, we're gonna kind of stick with that trend because we need to add one more feature before we get back into hardware. That feature is actually the only one that you guys have requested by name, and it's one I never really figured out when I built the first version of this module. That feature is Pitch Bend. You wouldn't think it, but the changes we need to make are going to be relatively involved. So if this is the first video that you're watching, I highly recommend going back and watching at least video 4, where I talk about the way that frequencies work on the YM3812. Supporting Pitch Bend is going to affect a lot of things, so before we get into the code, Let's talk about some of the core concepts involved and get a game plan together. Pitch bend is just another event that gets triggered on MIDI whenever you adjust the pitch wheel. Moving it to the right increases the pitch, and moving it to the left decreases it. And when the wheel is in the middle, the pitch stays locked on the original note. Now the amount that the pitch goes up or down is determined by a different setting, the wheel note range. In general MIDI, by default, the range is four semitones. That means your pitch can go from two semitones flat to two semitones sharp. But of course you can change this all the way up to a full two octaves, which would allow you to go an entire octave sharp and an entire octave flat. The pitch bend property and the wheel note range work together to determine how much the pitch is going to change when you move the pitch bend wheel. So for example, in this case, with a four semitone wheel range, Every 1,000 hex units that the value of pitch bend goes up is going to equate to a full semitone increase in the pitch. More generally, we can define the size of a note within the pitch bend property as being the highest possible value of pitch bend, which is 3 FFF in hexadecimal, divided by the number of semitones in the wheel range. Another thing we need to keep track of is the furthest number of semitones that our wheel range can go from the center. This is just the wheel range divided by 2. So let's go through a quick exercise to use these formulas to calculate a pitch bent note. We start with the original note and then subtract bend note offset to get the lowest possible note on the pitch wheel. We then add back the value of pitch bend divided by the bend note size that we calculated earlier. This is going to give us a new note based on the pitch bend that's rounded down to the closest semitone. Incidentally, this piece of the formula here we're going to call bend note. It represents the number of semitones to change the original note by in order to get the new pitch bent note. Now, pitch bend shouldn't only shift in semitone increments. It's actually supposed to be very gradual and continuous between notes. And this means that when we divide pitch bend by bend note size, we're going to have to keep track of the remainder of that division so that we know how close our pitch needs to be to the next note. And we do that by using the modulus operator. Okay, we now have two formulas. One that tells us how many semitones to shift by when we're trying to find which note to play, and then another one that tells us how close we are to the next note. With these two pieces in place, let's go back and look at how the YM3812 thinks about frequencies. This chip uses a register called frequency number to describe the frequency of the note that you want to play. In the fourth episode, we went through and calculated a set of 30 of these numbers based on the 3.59 MHz clock that's connected to the YM3812. Each of these 30 frequency numbers map to 30 different MIDI notes, starting at MIDI note 0. Now, the YM3812 only uses 10 bits to represent the frequency number. So the largest number that we can represent is MIDI note number 30, which has a value of 3CF in, in hexadecimal. Not to fear though, because the YM3812 has another property called block that bumps everything up an octave. So to get to MIDI note number 31, we first increase the block number by 1, and then we repeat the last 12 elements from our frequency number array. To go higher than that, we increment the block number again, and so on. Okay, so now let's talk about pitch bend. Say we play MIDI note number 19. If we pitch bend that note up, we can interpolate between frequency numbers of 205 and 224 based on the remainder that we calculated earlier. But what if we want to adjust MIDI note number 30? 
Unfortunately, we have to set the frequency number to something outside of the range that a 10-bit number can represent. So this begs the question, why do we choose the top numbers of the array anyway? And again, as we calculated in video number four, it's because the higher numbers of the array are generally the most in tune. And in fact, the redness of each of the cells here reflects how far each of the notes is out of tune. Now I say generally more in tune because there are a couple of exceptions, like notes 19 and 21 aren't as in tune as notes 17 and 18. But thankfully we can take advantage of this by lowering our repeating range from 19 to 30 down one to 18 through 29. And if we do this, it's gonna ensure that we always have one higher valid frequency number in our array than whatever note it is that we want to play. So let's take a peek at how we calculate these numbers. This is the chart that we made in video four, and it shows how we take a MIDI note and use it to figure out which block to use and which index from our frequency number array to use. To move everything down, we just have to adjust our ranges. So for the first 17 notes, we're gonna use block zero and MIDI note as our frequency number index. And then for notes 18 through 113, we can use our fancy formulas. And then anything MIDI note 114 and higher, we're just not gonna be able to represent. The last trick is that we don't want to use MIDI note as our note anymore. We wanna actually look up the MIDI note plus the bend note, which represents that full number of semitones that our pitch is gonna be bent by. Now we can use this frequency number index to find the frequency number for the note in our array. But of course, the story doesn't end here because the actual frequency is going to be somewhere between this note and the next note based on that bend remainder that we calculated earlier. So we're going to take these two frequency numbers and we're going to subtract the smaller one from the larger one in order to get the distance between the two notes. And then we're going to multiply that by the percentage of a note that our pitch bend property went beyond the last semitone. We store that in bend remainder, but we still need to divide that by the size of the note to get a percentage. Finally, we need to add back the lower frequency number to get the final frequency number for the pitch. Just one final side note, the order of operations here is actually important because we're dealing with integers and we can't multiply anything by a decimal point. That means we need to multiply the things on the top first before we divide by bend note size. Otherwise, we would just get zero. Okay, that's all the theory. Let's see how we program it. This is a flow diagram that shows how the various functions call each other in order to play a note. You might remember this from the eighth video in the series when we added velocity control. As the complexity of our code increases, I think these diagrams are gonna become more and more helpful. Okay, just to review, the top of the diagram represents things that happen in the .ino file, and the bottom includes the things that happen in the YM3812 class. When a note plays, the handle note on function receives a MIDI channel, a MIDI note, and the velocity for the note, which it wants to play. It passes that on to the patch note on function in the YM3812 class, along with the patch of the sound that you want to play. That function then chooses a slot on the YM3812 to play the note on, and then sets all of the properties for the channel in the channel states array. The channel states array is just our temporary storage for anything that we need to know is happening on the YM3812 chip. The function then calls channel play note, which uploads the patch information and sets the frequency of the note and then turns the note on. Now one tweak I'd like to make here is that the patch note on function passes both a channel and a MIDI note to the channel play note function. But it doesn't really need to do that because the MIDI note has already been set in the channel states array. And since we know which channel in the channel states array to pull, we can just grab the MIDI note from there. And this is kind of important now because in addition to the MIDI note, we're also gonna need to know how many semitones to bend by, and also how many sub notes, or better yet, like the remainder of a note that we need to bend by as well. So let's add those properties here. And here's what this looks like in code. I use a signed 8-bit integer for bend note because it can be positive or negative. And I use a 16-bit unsigned integer for the remainder because, depending on how many notes we divide our wheel range across, this could need up to 13 bits to represent. There are also two other properties that we need to keep track of within our YM3812 class. These are determined based on the range of notes covered by our pitch bend wheel. 
To see how these get assigned, let's add a new function here called setBendRange, and we're going to pass it the number of notes that we want the range to include. Now, general MIDI allows for a range of up to two octaves, or 24 notes. Our algorithm is actually going to support significantly more than that, but I am going to mandate that the range be an even number so that we're only dealing with a whole number of semitones up or down. So if you used, for example, a range of three, then you'd be able to bend one and a half notes up and one and a half notes down. Those half notes make things a lot more complex, so I'm just going to disregard that, and we're going to assume that our range is an even number. Now, if we have less than two notes, then our range is going to be effectively zero, and that's going to cause all kinds of problems. So I'm going to ignore anything under two notes. Okay, now bend offset gets set by simply dividing the wheel range by two. So it represents the number of notes to subtract to get to the bottom of that wheel range. Bend note size is going to take the largest possible pitch bend value, which is 3FFF, and it's going to divide it by the number of notes in the range. But with that slight exception of I'm going to force the wheel range to be an even number by setting the last bit to zero. Anyway, the result of this could be a value as high as 8192. So again, bend note size has to be a 16-bit integer. OK, now let's go back and see how bend note and bend remainder get set in the channel states array. These two properties are going to be updated by the patch note on function. And to do that, the function is going to have to receive a pitch bend argument from whatever calls it. So let's add that pitch bend argument here, and then we'll take a peek at the function. There's really only one new piece of code here right in the middle where we calculate bend note and bend remainder. For speed purposes, I handle the two cases separately. If the value of pitch bend is 0x2000, then the pitch wheel is centered, and there really is no pitch bend. And actually, 99% of the time, that's exactly what's going to happen because we're not usually pitch bending a note. So I figured, why not cheat and just set things to zero because it's way faster than calculating the real formula. If it's not zero, of course, then we do need to calculate the formula, but it's still pretty simple. We just take the pitch bend value and divide by bend note size, which we calculated based on the real range, and then we subtract bend note offset. This is going to result in a whole number of semitones that you want to move up or down based on that value of pitch bend. Now, when we divide pitch bend by bend note size, we got an integer, but there's still that fractional remainder that tells us how close we are to the next note. We need that to create a smooth pitch bend. So instead of dividing by bend note size, we take the modulus of it, and that's going to give us the remainder. Okay, now that we've set bend note and bend remainder, Let's see how they get used by the play note function. Wait a minute, what happened to all the pitch setting code? Well, I pulled that out into its own function called channel set pitch. Let's take a look. Okay, yeah, that's more like it. Don't worry, we can break this down into four parts. In the first part, we take the semitone portion of pitch bend and we add it to the MIDI note. This is gonna tell us which bass note we want to play. Then we use pretty much the same code that we used before to calculate the block number and the index of the frequency number in our frequency scale array. Only we're going to shift those cutoffs down by 1. So 114 became 113, 19 became 18. This ensures that we always have that one note that's above us in the frequency scale array. Then in the next section, we use that index to get the frequency number for the current note and the frequency number for the next note in the array. I'm calling these the, the low frequency number and the high frequency number. Then we use bend remainder from the channel state to interpolate between those two numbers. Now, one small nuance here is that because bend remainder can be so large, we need to cast these numbers into 32-bit integers instead of 16-bit ones before we multiply them together. But then once we divide by note size, it's going to be back to a 16-bit range, so that'll be fine. OK, so now that we have our frequency number, we can go ahead and send it along with the block number to the registers of the line 3812. If you're still with me, then awesome, because that was by far the most complex part. Let's jump back a level now and look at the .ino file. When a note gets pressed, we now need to send the pitch bend property. But where do we get it? Well, it comes from a different MIDI signal, and we now need a new handler function to deal with it. 
That function is going to take a MIDI channel and a 16-bit pitch bend value, and then it's going to store that pitch bend value for each of those 16 MIDI channels in an array. Then the handle note function is going to look for whatever the latest pitch bend value is for that channel, and it's going to pass it on into the patch note on function. Let's take a quick look at the handle note on function. It's pretty much the same, but now we pass this inst pitch bend entry for the MIDI channel. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Let's take a look at the handle pitch bend function. So here we take the pitch bend and we assign it into the inst pitch bend ray. But first we add 2000 hex. We do this because the MIDI library tries to be really helpful and subtract 2000 so that the center of the pitch bend wheel is at zero. But we don't want that. We're actually gonna take care of that in our own code. So to undo it, we have to add back the 0x2000, and that's going to give us an unsigned integer that runs from 0 up to 3ffF. Finally, we call patch pitch bend in our YM3812 class. But hold on, we haven't implemented anything called pitch bend yet. Okay, let's back up for a second. When you play a note, you want to make sure that the pitch bend gets accommodated in the pitch of that note. And we've done that in the note on function. But what's more likely is that you're going to play a note and then you're going to use the pitch bend to slide it up and down. So we're going to need a function that can take notes that are already being played and then change their pitch based on the pitch bend. But of course, we only want to bend the notes associated with the current instrument. And the way that we differentiate that is by passing a pointer to the patch that's associated with the instrument along with the pitch bend value. Then it's just a matter of looping through all of the channels in the channel states array, checking to see if it's playing the current patch, and then updating the pitch bend settings just like we did in the note on function. Here, let's have a look. This middle section here updates the pitch bend settings for the channel, and it's the same logic that we added to the patch note on function. That's why I've just left it gray. But that code is then wrapped in a loop that goes through each channel to check to see if the patch is the same as the one that was passed into the function. If it is, it updates the pitch bend information. Then, after setting bend note and bend remainder, it calls the channel set pitch function to update the block and frequency number registers of the YM3812. Interestingly, because this is not changing the note on register, the pitch changes, but the note doesn't replay. And that's exactly what we're looking for. With that, let's try uploading this thing and see if it works. One of the other things we didn't cover in this video was setting the wheel bend range using a MIDI RPN command. They're a little bit more complicated, and I just didn't want to get into it in this video. But if you're interested, again, it's all in the code that's on GitHub. Okay, so this only has a four note range right now. So let's try sending an RPN command that increases that to a full four octaves. The way we're going to do this is by sending a MIDI command using this terminal utility called send MIDI. It's pretty simple. You just pass the name of the device, and then we want to send RPN command number zero, and the value is going to be. Well, let's see here, we want a range of 48 notes. So we take 48 and we left shift that by seven bits. Wait, did I mention that RPN commands are a little bit strange? And then we just take this number and then we type it in. Okay, let's try this out. And with that, I think we've now gone through almost all of the secrets required to add pitch bend. 
at this point, I think we're getting to the end of what we can do with the hardware that we have. So for the next video, we're actually going to go back to the breadboard. You know, now that we know how to alter velocity and pitch, what I'd like to do is add a second YM3812 chip and then maybe get stereo panning or maybe even stereo detuning working. So if you're interested in that, consider liking this video and subscribing. It, it really helps the channel grow. And again, you can find all the code for this on uh, GitHub and you can read an article about it on thingsmadesimple.com. Thanks again for watching and uh, we'll see you next time.